everybody tonight. How's everybody doing? See a lot of familiar faces out there. Everybody doing all right? No problems? Everybody's got problems. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for you to say. Now, wait a minute. You know, we've got all kinds of problems in this world right now, but I guess we'll work our way through them. Well, um, again, welcome tonight to the program. Uh, of course, our speaker is an old member of the society, and uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about the history of her family, one of the founders of Westfield. But before we uh, introduce her and get started, there's a couple things we want to go over. Um, one thing right off the bat is we need to put together a slate for officers for next year. We're going to have nominations in December. So tonight I'd like to at least start that slate with some possible uh, people that you think might be willing to take an office. Um, so you got a pencil piece of paper, Diane? You're the secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put it on camera. <laughs> I will have it in a second. Well, I, I got to thinking about it, and since we don't have our meeting in December or in November, this is the one to do it at. Well, you decided you wanted to come in the A, and everything is in my car, not the A. Well, I, have, I excuse you. It's all right. <laughs> You're excused. Okay, um, anybody want to speak up and say they'd like to do an office or you know somebody would like to? Let's fill that chart. <laughs> well, I think I know somebody I'd like to see put on the slate. I'd like to see Joe Sanders put on the slate for president. I, I think uh, Joe is very capable of doing that and I think he's ready for it. And uh, I, I, I would like to see his name put on the slate for that. <laughs> anybody else? Mike, you got anybody in mind? Mm. You can think of somebody. Come on. Mm. I don't know. I think Diana should be vice president. <laughs> All right. Diana's got to have her, her name on the slate for vice president. Now she's going to get you. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't know what that does. You've been vice president? You That's Joe. That's what Joe does now. <laughs> he, he backs up. He backs up. Only when president dies. No. Yeah. <laughs> I said that they made me vice president. <laughs> <laughs> that was obvious. But um, you saw Jim do it for how many years and then you saw me do it a little bit? I'd like to nominate Linda for treasurer again if she'd take it. Well, we're just taking the slate tonight. We're not taking the nominations. Just, oh. just if you think there's somebody you think would well, like to run or take the office. I'd like to get Steve Hoover in there somewhere. What do you think, Steve? You got anything? I think you almost done at a Grand Junction yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> Steve uh, would make an excellent person for one of the offices. I don't think so. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've got uh, a lot of uncertainties right now. <laughs> okay. Um, Would Michael want the museum, think about the museum curator again? Or the newsletter? That goes with curator stuff. <laughs> <laughs> since when? <laughs> oh, since this year. <laughs> um, yeah, seeing as we didn't get as much curating done as we wanted to this year because of the museum opening and stress and everything, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do it one more year. But I need help from everybody, as always. Um, as everybody does. Put Bill Marr a lot down there. I'd like to... to maybe see if Bill and somebody else would join up and maybe do uh, some programming. Maybe not just have one person do it, maybe a couple people. I'll talk to Bill. Program committee? Mm -hmm. For program committee? I don't know. I, I know we've had one person all this time. and. Uh, when I used to do it, I know it was pretty tough, and you probably found it just as tough sometimes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's really easy. Mm -hmm. I think if we had a couple of people doing it, I think that would be wonderful. Someone backs out on your last minute, and then you're scrambling. You're scrambling constantly. And, uh, Rachel, would you be interested in doing it? Seriously, because I think it takes more than one person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you're scrambling. It is a fun job. You begin to develop the network. 
I, I would like to, you know, kick that around a little bit. Maybe a lot of these uh, positions might need two people. You know? Would Carol consider secretary? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I can't spell. <laughs> Carol does an awesome job at um, that kind of thing. I've seen her books and stuff, and she does spell. She's just. No, I use spell check on the computer. There you go. What do you need? No, I'd, I'd like to wait another year before I get active again because um, John is going through that mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. And we're going down to the VA quite a bit. I understand. Okay. So I've, I've got. We'll ask you again next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, tonight we're not nominating anybody. We're just kind of kicking around names yeah. and putting it on a slate to where later on we'll contact some of these people, even if they're not here. If you know that they'd like to do it, fine. There you go. Yeah, if you know of anybody just like to, you know, do any of that stuff, why speak up and we'll, we'll get a hold of them. I don't know if this lady is here, but she's going, I will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her hand up, yeah. <laughs> That's my daughter. She lives at Noblesville. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, okay. We'll, we'll leave it at that. But um, everybody be thinking between now and December, if you see one of the other members or you call somebody you know and they, you think they'd like to do something like that, encourage them to. We need people to step up and do it. The same group can't do it time after time after time again. It needs to have new blood, new people. And it, you know, it's rewarding. It's a, it's a good experience and you certainly learn from it, I can tell you that. So, okay. Uh, one small item I wanna go over real quick. I was called by the mayor about a week or so ago and uh, the subject of the old home up here next to Union Bible College is on the table again, whether or not it can be restored. The, the college wants to tear it down or the, if we find somebody to restore it. I met with one of the representatives Monday night. Um, I, I, like I told him, I don't know. Uh, this, that's a big project for a group like ours. If there's somebody that you know has a connection with that home and would like to try to, you know, take this thing on and be a champion of it, maybe they can get something done. We would, uh, we would help. Yeah, we would help. Uh, Judy Carpenter was trying to get something done a long time ago right. in that home. Yeah, I know she was. I don't know if she got anywhere with she it. She has some family members that were Yeah, that was her great-great-great-grandfather, I believe. Yeah. Um, I understand the floors are bad in it. The house is in pretty bad shape. Um, but really and truly, it's not been changed a whole lot on a lot of the things, like the doors are still original, the windows are still the original windows, you can see the pegs in the corners, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the brick's been painted. Um, inside, yeah, they put down seven layers of linoleums, and <laughs> carpets, somebody's put drywall over everything again, over the plaster, and it's all fallen. And it'd be quite a bit of work. You'd have to get another grant to probably do something like that. Right, and I think the biggest <laughs> threshold that you'd have to cross is you need to find out something that's very historic about it. It can't just be the house that the president lived in. I mean, it's going to have to be well, something there, else. Well, there is a hidden uh, trap door in the closet. That yeah, I was down the, the cell. house, yeah. But, but I think it was built yeah. after this. Uh, the underground the house railroad itself? movement. Hmm? The house itself? I think the house what was probably was... built when the school was built. That'd That's be 61. 1861, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which had been at the tail end of uh, right. underground activity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if anybody knows anybody that knows anything about that place, call them, have them call me, let me know. Because they want some kind of recommendation very quickly. Uh, they're asking the town to tear it down. So. You know, you, keep, you hate to keep losing these old places. Every once in a while, you'd like to go back in and save one. But, uh, you know, it, it, always, it takes a lot of money. And, and it also takes people that step forward and say, yeah, I'll take on that project. I'll do it. And it wouldn't be a very involved project. Um, and you may never, may never get the funds. You may go for a year and still not get the funds. So, anyway, that's out there on the table. 
Um, third item. Um, we've been looking into getting t-shirts or possibly sweatshirts. And uh, we have a little uh, logo we've sent to these uh, people up here. What is the name <coughs> of this shop again? Um, My, logo. My Logo Shop? My Logo Shop. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm going to pass this around. Didn't they just take our logo and, and change it around a little bit? Well, and, and they got they one suggested on here. something else, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is what they finally came up with, right? Yes. This bottom green one. So um, I think what we'd like to do, if we have enough interest, people like to have a t shirt or a sweatshirt, if we can get some preliminary orders. We need 24 of an item. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be the same item. Not the same one. Of anything, 24 things. But it has to be in a garment. Yes. Because I know they may have they umbrellas have and all and kinds of stuff. All sorts of mm -hmm. shirts and sweatshirts. Um, I don't know why we couldn't get 24 people to say they'd like to have a t-shirt or something like that. It wouldn't be that many, I don't think, amongst this group. And they could also, if we wanted to put the original logo on, a sleeve or the back or front or wherever, you could also have that put on. Uh, That'd be bad, yeah. So this on the back, Linda, if, if we had an order of 60 t-shirts, we would get 12 free? Yes. And it would be $7 a piece? Yes. So if we went that way. And then we could, you know, sell them. Yeah. More than that. And we would sell them at the, at the uh, museum, too. That, that would be a fundraiser, mm -hmm. too. So. I'll pass that around. Everybody look at that logo. I know some of you have already seen it. Because <coughs> we'd like to get something. I'm sure done with that. We've been talking to him for how long now? Quite a while. It's <laughs> yeah. so. mm -hmm. Now I'm going to let Mike come up here and uh, he's going to talk about his trip to uh, Philadelphia, wasn't it? Yep. And uh, him and Paula went and he's going to tell you a little bit about what they did there. I'm just going to be really quick about it. Um, the Hamilton County Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, Brenda Myers, came to us, like, what, beginning of September or middle of September, asking if we would be interested in going to that conference. It was the uh, Friends of the Network to Freedom Association Underground Railroad Conference. It's the second year they did that. And Brenda, of course, partly wanted us to go because all they already did for us with the museum opening but they also uh, were thinking of next year, because in 2009, the conference is going to be in Indianapolis. So she wanted us, somebody, to be there to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how they can maybe incorporate Hamilton County next year as well, because obviously for Underground Railroad, that would be very important. Um, it was a great conference. Paula and I uh, went there, and uh, it was going on the whole week, Monday to Saturday. We went only, uh, flew over there Wednesday night and had Thursday and Friday there. The conferences where most of the sessions were the days before they had like tours where they went to historic sites or uh, sites for research. So it was very interesting to, to read about here in the brochure. But we saw only the sessions they had. And those sessions were really interesting because they had two going at, the most, at, this, um, at most of the times. So it was really good that Paula and I could go. So we could see all of them, almost. And um, it was just very fascinating. It had a lot of uh, history related to Underground Railroad in Philadelphia, of course. They had uh, also a lot of about how they teach and how they uh, talk about the Underground Railroad to students, to tourists, to anybody uh, going. There a lot of people, of course, of the National Park System were there because uh, a lot of national parks are on the Underground Railroad Network for Freedom um, system they have in place all over the United States. So that was that was really fascinating to see how they teach about it in the different sites. There was a I don't know if you saw that one, the Whaling Port in in Maryland, uh, who was uh, used by a lot of uh, African Americans after they escaped to stay there and was kind of out of the way and. And they had really good uh, way of life there too, so it was it was really good. Um, if we have time, we should definitely offer 
to put Westfield on the tour for next year if they want to do that. Donna Luke Stoke, Lucas Stokes, uh, who was here at the town hall meeting we had uh, one day, um, she's a part organizer, so she's going to be instrumental in in doing that with us, I'm sure. And um, yeah, they had a lot of the panels uh, sessions they had. They had three people speak about a related subjects about the different uh, avenues they have, the different parks they have, the different programs they have, and it would be good if uh, somebody from us would also maybe represent in one of the programs there. But yeah, if you guys want to look at the program uh, they did for it, I have it here, I'll leave it up here for you guys to have a look at. And um, what we should also mention, I don't know if you want to, um, the historical marker. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, back on the 9th of October, uh, if you'll, you noticed in your uh, the newsletter, the historical marker was dedicated. It's up at Asa Bell's Park on Hoover Street. And of course it depicts the event of the Rhodes Incident back in 1843. Um, we had a pretty nice ceremony that day. Uh, Mike, myself was there, the mayor, a lot of the town and officials. Uh, we had some people from Indiana Historical Society. Um, Indiana Historical Bureau. Bureau, that's mm -hmm. right, Indiana Historical Bureau. They're the ones that take care of those markers. And uh, we also had a, a gentleman from Sheridan, sure. Mr. Spears. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that is the fifth marker in Hamilton County, I believe. I think that's what I said, yeah. The first one in Washington Township. Um, those are really very unique. It takes an awful lot of documentation mm -hmm. to get one of those. So, you know, we're really pretty proud that we've, we've attained that. The town um, pretty much put that into motion about three years ago. Two or three years ago. And I got a call from one of the gentlemen. He doesn't work here anymore. And uh, told him some of the facts. And then he went to uh, the bureau. Uh, what was her name? Uh, Jeannie Regandinios from the DNR. Right. Department of Natural Resources, yeah. And they they, uh, they checked all the documentation, and uh, so the sign's up there. You get a chance, go up there and, and read it. It's kind of unique because the story's on both sides, not the same thing. The story's on one side, and then it goes ahead and continues on the other side. So it, it's a very unique one. I don't know if they're, they're they said they started doing that. Mm -hmm. But most of them always had the same thing on each side, but not this one. So, uh, like I said, we're very proud to have that. Um, okay, I think we might, might as well go ahead and get started. Now, the, the person that's going to speak tonight really doesn't need any introduction. I think all of you know her, but uh, she's here again tonight to tell us uh, the story of her family. And I appreciate her coming in. I know she's got a lot on her plate right yeah. now. And uh, it's just always nice to hear of uh, one of the local stories, especially from one of the descendants. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Carol Dobbins Beck. Let you go ahead and start. Okay. Um, I've done a lot with uh, the genealogy, and uh, the reason that I've included it is because a lot of the early settlers really trace back to the same people. You'd be surprised how related we all are. <laughs> so. Um, I'm going to go through this uh, pretty fast uh, because I have a lot of information and so don't panic when you see a lot on the screen. Um, I have a timeline, whoops, I'm going to give that to you. <coughs> okay, what's the timeline? This will help put things together. Pass it around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I also have a uh, printout of the slides that I'm going to be showing. They're in the uh, that blue notebook right there, and 
you know, if you have any questions or if I go too fast, we, you can look at the notebook or, or ask me after the talk. Um, I've got generation numbers. Um, you'll see them throughout, and I'll talk about them throughout, but that's just to help you get an idea of people's relationships because of their generation number. Uh, some of my sources I've got listed up here. Um, the, uh, primitive history of Hamilton County, and um, I've, I've got a lot of the books there on the table that, that were used. Uh, I've got uh, a green notebook, the second one over there. That is, I've uh, got, um, I've scanned newspaper clippings that have had um, history of Westfield. So there's, um, all my sources are backed up with, with the newspaper clippings and the books because I don't come up with anything original myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the moon genealogy starts with um, the king of the Swedes, born in 256 AD in Sweden. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, gener uh, generation 26 is Ivan Jarl of Norway, born in 783. And Generation 29 is Rollo, Duke of Normandy, born 854 in France. Normandy is northeast France, named after the Norsemen who conquered in the 800s. Uh, generation 34 is William de Normandy, the Conqueror. He married Matilda van uh, Vladeren, the daughter of the Duke of Flanders, and his son is <coughs> William de Moen, born 1066 in Normandy, France. And this is where the moon line, it turns into the moon line. King William of Normandy, uh, the Conqueror, was born in 1027 at Falaise, France. He died September 9th, 1087 in Rouen, France. Uh, in 1035, uh, Robert, his father, went on a pilgrimage. Before setting out on his trip, Robert forced the lords to swear allegiance to William, although William was Ill illegitimate. He was Robert's only living son. Several leading Norsemen uh, became William's guardians. In 1045, William began to govern Normandy. Pope Alexander II sent William his blessings in his campaign to gain the throne of England. To make sure he had enough Norsemen to defeat King Harold, uh, he asked the men of Burgundy, Brittany, and Flanders to help. William also arranged for soldiers from Germany, Denmark, and Italy to join his army. In exchange for his service, William promised them the share of the land and wealth of England. William was crowned King of England in December 25, 1066. I have a genealogy showing 20 American presidents that descended from William the Conqueror, including George H. Bush. In addition to that, uh, the genealogy, I have, um, in addition to the genealogy, uh, George W. Bush and Barack Obama are said to be distantly related. Uh, the moon history, and this is from uh, Larry Moon Jr. The ancestral history of the moons is said to have originated in Denmark. During a certain period of history, the Kingdom of Denmark formed a part of the English domain under the partial rule of England. At this time, William the Conqueror requested uh, from the King of Denmark a regiment of soldiers as bodyguards. The Danish monarch issued orders that the best men of his kingdom be selected, men erect in stack stature, athletic, light complexion, and red hair. A regiment from the best families were recruited, and they called themselves the Order of the Crescent. The banner they bore was in the Danish national colors with a half moon, or crescent, on, as the insignia. Uh, they rendered excellent service in the king, to the king. In one occasion during a battle, the king met such stubborn resistance from the enemy that he was forced to call on volunteers. The Order of the Crescent came forward and was successful in subduing the enemy. As a reward for their bravery, the king granted them land in England. He presented them with a coat of arms, and the company unanimous, unanimously adopted the surname Moon. Uh, kings and lesser nobles were often granted a coat of arms as a sign of nobility, but a like number was bestowed as a reward for valor. The moons earned theirs for gallantry in action and not by an accident of birth. The moons prospered in their adopted country and concerned themselves with the civil 
and religious affairs of their community. The first use of the coat of arms was for identification on the battlefield. Many times deeds of valor were recorded with a memorable symbol. The fact of a recording of a coat of arms means the bearer's surname had its origins at least as far back as medieval times. It also means that family's name was singled out ages ago to be lifted from conformity to and personal extinction. Um, from uh, J.W. Moon, the Moon line of ancestry goes back to Alfred the Great and the Duke of Flanders, one of whose daughters, Matilda, married William the Conqueror, down through the Earls of Devonshire and their descendants in America. Although bearers of the old and distinguished name comprised a small fraction of the population, a surprising number of them have gained worldwide recognition. Listing a few of its famous members includes uh, Peter Moon, 1548, an English poet. Uh, John Barclay Moon, 1849 to 1915, was a lawyer. He was the first member of the Moon family in Virginia. He was a master of a vessel trading between the colony and England. He was a member of the Colonial House of Burgesses. Uh, John Barclay Moon was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates uh, in 1881 and re-elected in uh, 1883 and 1893. Don uh, Pardee Moon, 1894 to 1944. He graduated first in his class at the United States Naval Academy in 1916. He rose to Rear Admiral in 1944. During the struggle against the German submarines in the North Atlantic, he put into effect several anti-submarine devices which proved most effective. He was decorated uh, by the Russians, English, and French governments in recognition of his distinguished service to the Allied cause. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal and the Legion of Merit. Okay, Generation 41 is John B. Bowen, he was born in uh, 1219 in Devon, England. And Generation 51 is Richard Bowen, born in uh, 1485 in Dorset, England. Generation 52 is Robert Moon, and that's spelt with an E on the end of it, born in uh, 1525 in Dorset, England. His son is Robert Moon, born 1557 in Lancashire, England. Generation 54 is William Moon, born in 1610 in Bristol, England. He married Catherine Ann King. Now we start with the map here. We'll see if I can point out a few places. Right up here is the town of Moon in Ireland, in uh, Kildare uh, County. And over here is Wales. Uh, we've got Bristol down here, um, Somerset, and Devon down here. <coughs> Those are some of the names where some of the people have come from. Uh, the Moon family uh, became Quakers. The Quaker movement was started by George Fox. He was born in 1624. Fox embarked on his lifetime mission to persuade his fellow men and women to worship honestly, not through the priesthood or religious organizations, but from within themselves directly to the Almighty be true to themselves and others. George Fox founded the Society of Friends or Quakers about 1648 and helped revive Christianity in a needy time. He saw that God most desired for man a personal relationship, that it was possible through faith in Jesus Christ to have sins forgiven, guilt removed, and thus enter into a close personal relationship with a holy God. Around 1655, George Fox traveled through England, Holland, and Germany. The Society of Friends members refused to join the Church of England. They were likely to be uh, they were likely to be illiterate, few from the very poor, and few from the few from the ranks of the gentry. In 1649, George Fox experienced his first imprisonment for disputing a cleric's biblical views. What made Quakers so dangerous and troublesome was their resolute refusal to accept the authority of the priest and the state church. The Quakers were subjected to acute persecution in the 1650s. A new act reinstated the obligation in England to <coughs> attend state religious Sunday services, which was used to imprison Quakers. Also, the vagrancy laws were used to imprison traveling Quakers. 
by January 1660, more than 4,000 were in jails across the country. The early Quaker preachers provoked communal trembling from the congregation thus named Quakers. The name Society of Friends was not used in the 17th century. It only gained acceptance in the early 19th century. The post-1660 persecution that lasted more than 10 years shaped Quaker history. Fox declared, the spirit of Christ will never move us to fight a war against any man with carnal weapons, weapons of this world. Around 1665, George Fox traveled to Jamaica, Cuba, and the colonies, including North Carolina, and ending at William Penn Colony. George Fox died in 1691. In 1664, William Penn opposed the, to war because of Quaker beliefs, laid aside his sword before his father, Admiral of the British Navy. Born in England in 1644, he was opposed by his father and unjustly imprisoned because of his stand. He remained true to his newfound faith. Later in life, the King of England offered a large grant of land in America, which became <coughs> Pennsylvania, in payment for a debt owed his father. Penn drew up a constitution which provided that every person was to be free to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. He proposed that the Indians be paid for their land and would be treated with trust. The laws were humane. Prisons were to be designed for rehabilitation, not cruelty. There would be no forts or soldiers. He made a treaty with the Indians, never sworn to, and never, and never wrote. Uh, oops. Never broken. Okay, one historian wrote, no drop of Quaker blood was ever shed by a red man in Pennsylvania. Okay, Generation 54 is William Moon. Uh, Clarkson Moon wrote, um, Sir William Moon was an attendant in Queen Victoria, of Queen Victoria. As I read in an English paper, there were twin brothers who came to th this country from Wales before the revolution. One settled in Pennsylvania and the other in North Carolina near New Garden. My grandmother Moon's people, the Stouts, are from Holland. My grandfather Hyatt is said to be from French descent. Okay, again from Larry Moon. At some time during the Reformation, the Moons became converts to the religious movement Society of Friends or Quakers. A Quaker preacher named George Fox gave William Penn the idea of religious freedom could be found in the New World. On Penn's first trip to America, with about 100 persons, including two red-headed Moon brothers, their wives and children set sail from Deal County of Kent, England, on September 1, 1682, on the good <coughs> ship Welcome. They reached Newcastle on the Delaware River, October 27, 1682, one-third fewer in number because of the ravages of smallpox on the ship. John Moon, his wife Sarah Sneed, and their six children, and James <coughs> Moon, his wife uh, Joan Burgess, and uh, their uh, seven children settled on the land grant at Falsington, Pennsylvania. It was deeded jointly to the brothers by William Pan. They named it Bucks County, abbreviated <coughs> from their old home in Burlinghamshire County, England. Colonial farmers purchased their land from William Penn for 25 to 75 cents an acre, depending on the distance from Philadelphia. John remained in Pennsylvania, uh, where he raised his family. The original home site is now a railroad yard in Falsington, Pennsylvania. Generation 55 is James, also called Jasper Moon, <coughs> born in 1639 in Bristol, England. Uh, his son, James Moon Jr., was born in 1668 in uh, uh, Bristol, England. He married Agnes Priestley. Generation 57 is Simon Moon, born in 1700 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He married Lori Humphrey and had 12 children. Generation 58 is James Moon, born 1722 in Frederick County, Virginia. He married Ann Mendenhall and had six children. Generation 59 is John M. Moon, born in 1752 in West Virginia. He married Rachel Adams and had 13 children. They came to Cane Creek, North Carolina before 1774. 
This picture portrays the Quaker conviction that worship involves personal fellowship of the living Christ. See the ghost-like figure of Jesus in the picture. In 1689, the Society of Friends or Quakers were known for their humanitarian work, the education of children, and abandoning slave owning at an early date. Quakers became so prevalent in the late 1600s that a yearly meeting or confederation of regional meetings was established. Quakers were known for their uh, very simple, plain attire and outspoken rejection of slavery. They had a strong dedication to hard work and social advancement of the less fortunate. The uh, brown bonnet, there in the picture at the bottom, right down here, uh, belonged to Elizabeth Emily Beals, who attended Hingle Creek Friends and died in 1829. And the black cape and bonnet belonged to Tamar uh, Davis Fodry. Uh, from Westfield uh, Friends Meeting, who died in 1907. James Moon History by Wyman Moon. James Moon was born in England, August uh, 23, 1639, uh, and married Joan Burgess about uh, 1655. Before coming to America, she had been a clerk at the Bristol Monthly Meeting uh, records for many years. They sailed with William Penn and brought with them six children. They settled in Bucks County, Pennsylvania in 1682. James Moon was released from prison where he had been held because of Quaker beliefs on the condition that he leave for Pennsylvania immediately. He received a grant of 500 acres of land in Pennsylvania from his friend, William Penn. They were members of the Society of Friends Falls Meeting. James Moon established a colony of Moons in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and from there, the family is traced to Redstone, Western Pennsylvania, Western New York, and Virginia. The deed of lands from William Penn to John and James Moon is now in the possession of Charles Moon, son of James Moon, a linear descendant of John Moon. This land in Pennsylvania is the homestead of their first American ancestors. Jane Moon, the mother of Charles, was a lady of fine intellectual and cultural and advancement and was for many years the clerk of the Friends Yearly Meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. From the Friends Way, page 58, according to meeting records, some warlike Indians burst into the meeting of worship. The meeting continued in quiet reverence and the Indians sat down on benches and harmed no one. This was the result of spirit-filled lives. <clears throat> Joseph John Gurney, 1788 to 1847. He was a successful banker, uh, but devoted much of his preaching, much of his time to preaching, visiting Quaker meetings, distributing Bibles, and ministering to those with physical needs. The Gurneyite Quakers are named after him. Okay, my Aunt Alice Moon writes, this bowl was Susanna Moon's mixing bowl dated 1631. Susanna was Riley Moon's wife. The bowl was brought to America from Europe. And that's over there on the table. Uh, James Moon Jr., the son of James Moon and Joanne Burgess, was a sheriff of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and the first to leave the colony to move to the Old Do Domain, Dominion, Virginia, around 1696. At an early date, the colony of uh, the colony of North Carolina offered complete religious freedom in order to encourage immigration. This appealed to the Quakers, for Virginia had not been as tolerant of their beliefs as they had hoped. In, in Virginia, the plantation owners had slaves, and the Church of England was the predominant religion. About 1735, a large number of Quaker colonists <coughs> from Virginia and Pennsylvania immigrated to North Carolina. They settled in Randolph, Guilford, Alamance, and uh, Chatham counties where they formed colonies. Among those who had come at an early date was James Moon. He had married for a second time and had one son, John, who was born in 1715 near the Neuse River, Randolph County, North Carolina. When you see two marriages, it is because the first wife died. Quakers did not believe in divorce and there were no divorces in my family until around 1960. <coughs> Uh, James Moon Jr. had a son named uh, John whose mother, Agnes Priestley, died when he was young and he had, was bound out to learn the carpenter trade. At the end of the seven-year apprenticeship, he, uh, he immigrated to North Carolina 
and settled near the Neuse River. John's son, Joseph, moved from North Carolina to Tennessee. And then in 1809, he moved near Martinsville, Ohio, settling what would be known as the Moon Colony, consisting of 54 people. They were the first settlers in Clark Township, Clinton County, Ohio. Uh, Joseph had 829 great-grandchildren. Uh, James Jr. had another son named Simon, generation 57, born 1700 in Pennsylvania, who married Lori Humphreys. They moved to Virginia before 1722. The family immigrated to North Carolina in 1790. Their son, born in Frederick County, Virginia, and died in uh, North Carolina. Uh, he married Ann Mindenhall about uh, 1743 in Virginia. John's son, John Peter, a generation 59, was born in 1752 in Virginia and married Rachel Adams in 1773 in North Carolina. Their son, Simon, uh, generation 60, was the moon that settled here in Westfield. This just gives a little bit of the uh, travels. The Moon family starts out in Sweden, lived there 527 years, then Norway, 71 years, Normandy, France, 246 years, England, 582 years, only in Pennsylvania for 40 years, Virginia, 52 years, and then North Carolina for 46 years. And then came to Indiana in 1820 and have been here for 188 years. Uh, these are ex. Uh, this is from the uh, Simon Moon's will, <coughs> the one that was born in 1700 in Virginia. Um, first and principally, I recommend my soul unto the name of God that gave it, and my body nothing doubting, but at the general resurrection I shall receive the same again by the mighty power of God. I leave my present dwelling plantation. Uh, to be equally divided between my two sons, James and Jacob. And my will is that uh, the creatures reserved to work the plantation, and that would be slaves, uh, one half shall be Jacob's moons when of age. And that's on the 11th day of November, Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord, 1748. And this is the will of James M. Moon, he lived from 1722 to 1807 in Chatham County, North Carolina. My will is that my wife uh, live on my plantation with privileges of said plantation and the farming utensils while she remains my widow. To my son Jacob, uh, 100 acres of land, to him including the dwelling house where I now live. Also to my son Thomas, 98 acres of land on the south side of my plantation. And in this one, there's no slave. So between uh, this uh, Simon and his son James, they have given up their slaves. Uh, and then this is the will of uh, Generation 59, Jan John M. Moon, uh, Simon's, Simon Moon's father. I give my wife, Rachel Moon, full privileges of the house that I now live in and all the land that I possess and shall have full privileges to cultivate or rent out the land and enjoy the profits arising therefrom. And at her decease or marriage, I give land to my five sons. And he lists them out, uh, William, Simon, George, Jonathan, and Joshua, and each of them an equal part. So Simon Moon would have had um, a portion of the land there in North Carolina. And I give to my wife a part I hold in the company schoolhouse and the lot to be her at, at her entire disposal the 25th day in the second month, 1813. Many Quakers did not use names for the days of the week or the month because they had non-Christian <coughs> origins as the names of heathen gods. Uh, this instead would use uh, the first day for Sunday or the second month for February. Uh, 1731, uh, New Garden, North Carolina. Societies were found in the North and in the South for the gradual emancipation and, or release of the slaves. The first was at New Garden, North Carolina. 
Simon Moon, who later moved to Westville, was born in 1784 near New Garden. Simon Moon's ancestors moved to North Carolina before 1731. Quakers were outspoken in their opposition to slavery, and this caused much ill will. The colonial governor of North Carolina had passed a law making all marriages performed by Quaker preachers void and their offspring illegitimate. Simon Moon left North Carolina because of religious persecution of Quakers and to get away from the slave economy. He was actively involved in the Underground Railroad. Um, this is the 1934 centennial where my uncle Wyman is in the covered wagon with his family. And this is just to be an example of how the early settlers traveled. Uh, Wyman Moon was the great, great grandson of Simon Moon. Okay, this is the Western Migration Routes. There's quite a few routes, but um, let's see. That starts up here in uh, Pittsburgh. Let's see. Starts up in Philadelphia to Louisville and then to Paoli. So come down this way and then up this way to Paoli. Um, also on here, you've got New Garden where it's located, and right above it is Westfield, North Carolina. Generation 60, Simon Moon had seven children when they moved through Paoli, Indiana, settling east of Richmond, Indiana, near the Ohio line on November 11th, uh, 1820. So they came up through Paoli, but then they went over here to Richmond. This is just the Paoli map. This was provided by Larry Moon, who lives in southern Indiana. He is related through uh, the generation 57 Simon Moon, the great great grandfather of the Simon Moon who settled here. One of the most common beliefs Quakers were imprisoned for in England was refusing to bow or take off their hat to the king, believing that all were created equal and were not to be honored above another. Most friends disapproved of war or any form of violence. By 1689, the Society of Friends, or Quakers, had won tolerance in England. Uh, they were known for their honesty in business. <clears throat> friends helped to establish standardized pricing of goods offered for sale. They were known for their humanitarian work in prisons and the care of the insane. Later, they worked to improve relations with the American Indians. By 1947, the Friends Service Council of Great Britain and the American Friends Service Committee had each won a Nobel, Nobel Prize. Um, Quakers used thou, thy, and thee instead of you, which was a pearl, and was originally used as a form of honor reserved for persons of royalty. I remember my family using what was called plain language as late as 1959. That's my uh, grandmother, and that's the way she always spoke. She, she always used the, uh, what sounds like biblical, biblical language. After moving to Indiana, Simon had three more children. During the next 12 years, he settled in three more places, resting a total of four farmsteads from virgin Indiana forest. Uh, one is at Mooresville. Always moving northward, he moved two and a half miles southwest of Plainfield in Hendricks County, near Sugar Grove. The fourth was what was later became Westfield. Uh, Simon Moon was born April 9, 1784. He married Hannah Stout in 1808. Simon uh, built a log cabin on a hill near the Bethel Friends Meeting House, Mooresville, Indiana. <coughs> Artist Paul Hadley painted the, this building and the Mooresville Public Library owns the painting. During the Westville sesquicentennial, it was on loan to the Westville Public Library. It has been reported that when the cabin at Mooresville was destroyed long after Simon's death, two compartments were discovered flanking the fireplace. Each was large enough to hold two persons and each could only be reached by coming down through the attic. Okay, these are the children of Simon Moon. Joseph was born in Guilford County, North Carolina. He married Lydia Henshaw. They had six children born in Indiana and three born in Wisconsin. He died in Kansas. Um, Mary Moon was born in Guilford County, North Carolina. She married William Hyatt, July 24th, 1833 at Richland Quaker Meeting in Hamilton County, north of Carmel. 
This was the first marriage in Washington Township. Uh, Peter, John Peter Moon was born November 1812 in Guilford County, North Carolina. He married Lavina Burnsides at Rich Land Meeting. Uh, they had nine children born in Indiana. William Moon, born November 1812 in Guilford County, North Carolina. He and John Peter were twins. Uh, he was a farmer in the Eagle Town area. He, like his father and brother, were active in the Underground Railroad, using his house as a station. He married Phoebe Stout and had 10 children born in Indiana. He died in 1905 in Hamilton County. Riley Moon, uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, Sabina, or Sally, was born in Guilford County, North Carolina. She married Curtis Hyatt at Westfield, Indiana, and had eight children born in Hamilton County, three children born in Kansas. She died in Empor at Emporia, Kansas. Uh, Jonathan Moon, born in 1819 in Guilford County, North Carolina, died 1821 in Indiana at the age of two years. The Simon Moon family moved to Indiana in 1820, so this young child did not survive the move. Simon Moon Jr. was born in 1824 at Richmond, Indiana. He married Elizabeth Jane Boone, and they had 10 children born at uh, Westfield, um, where he died. His descendants have a Moon reunion um, in July. Martin Moon was from the line of Simon Jr. Hannah Moon, born 1828 in Rich, Richmond, Indiana, she married Jeremiah Cox in 1847. Illy Hugh Moon, born in 1831 at Mooresville, Indiana. They had two children born in Indiana and six children born in Kansas. He died in, at Emporia, Kansas. Um, in the Ledger article, the Underground Railroad, one of Westville's first endeavors, says, lacking documentation, there is no proof that Simon Moon was a professional Underground Railroad conductor, but his uh, background and seemingly random movement through the state would support that speculation. Mm. Now these are the uh, Indiana uh, Underground Railroad routes. The eastern route was from, uh, uh, and the most prominent one of the three was from Cincinnati uh, through Richmond, Indiana, where Simon Moon settled in 1820. So that's over there. The central route came through Louisville and Madison via Salem and Columbus to Bloomington and then up to Mooresville where Simon Moon settled in 1831. And then the route went up to Indianapolis and north to Carmel and Westville where Simon Moon settled in 1832. Just a little bit of a coincidence that he keeps settling right on the route. Uh, near the beginning, Near the beginning of organized fugitive slave traffic through Indiana, Simon Moon and his wife and their 10 children came from the Plainfield area to be the first uh, settlers in 1832 in what became the town of Westfield. From the A.K. Tomlinson historic resume, it says there was no roads where the present uh, U.S. 31 is located. The only way to, to Indianapolis was a wagon track which skirted the swamps and lowlands around Pool Creek. The following and following the high ground about a quarter of a mile west of South Union Street in Westfield. This was merely a winding path through the woods and was uh, scarcely passable even in the more favorable times of the year. Simon Moon, with the help of his sons, Riley, <coughs> Simon Jr., and William, cleared the farm at Westfield. Uh, Clarkson Moon writes, it was later called the Doan Farm, and Simon Moon was identified with pioneering efforts in the area. An account says that they arrived at sundown September 29th, and by the next evening he had built the first log house in the Westfield area. In the newspaper article, uh, The Underground Railroad, uh, one of Westfield's first endeavors by uh, Lee Luce, uh, says uh, taking Simon's background and his 12-year trek through virtually roadless Indiana into account, it's conceivable that Westfield did not spring up between Indianapolis and Logansport by chance. Simon was 48 years old, a farmer, tanner, cobbler, and an herb doctor. It is always recounted with pride by descendants that he was an active part in the humanitarian movement, the Underground Railroad, and, the, and, and in the vanguard of public opinion of the day. 
He was also an inspector for the first election in Washington Township. And this is the uh, plat map. Um, I have a plat map there on the table, but I've just <coughs> scanned a small section of it here. At the bottom, here at the, right here at the very bottom, um, that is uh, Harmon Cox. He's 38 years old and settled 158 acres uh, May 23rd, 1831. He was the first settler in Washington Township and came from North Carolina to Clinton County, Ohio in 1822, and then uh, Plainfield in 1827 and settled south of the present site of Westfield. Harmon Cox and Martha had a baby, Sally, the first white child to be born in Washington Township, May 21st, 1831. Cox spent the rest of his life in the area. In the back of my uh, slideshow uh, notebook, I have a Cox genealogy, which uh, goes back to uh, Gaius Julius Caesar and through uh, William Clayton, uh, born 1832, and also uh, Walter Leacock from Normandy, born uh, 1024. It includes Thomas Cox that came uh, to Jamestown in, in his ship, the Friendship, and settled in Virginia, and the Cox coat of arms. The white notebook, the white book note over there, that has the genealogy of Thomas Cox, born in 1620 in England, and goes down to myself, also to Norman Cox, the uh, Channel 6 newscaster, and to David Kendall, the uh, President Clinton's lawyer during the impeachment. David Kendall, uh, in the 1960s, helped in the voter registration drive in Mississippi. Okay, the next one up is Simon Moon, right up here. Uh, above, uh, Simon Moon settled 70 acres, dated September 13, 1832, <coughs> the first settler in what became Westfield. To the right is Ambrose Osborne right here. And if you can see, the spelling <laughs> is uh, Ambrose is spelled with a Z, and then it's Ogbine, O-G-B-I-N-E. Uh, above Simon Moon is Asa Bales, settled the next, uh, just a few days later. 160 acres. The top moon up here is Simon Moon also. Um, this is 160 acres, six, 160 acres dated April 26, 1834. Notice 11 days before Westfield was founded. And then to the right is William Moon up here. And that's dated um, August 4th, 1835. Now southwest of Simon Moon down yeah, right down there is a Robert Parker. He settled um, February 19th, 1834. And then there's a Nathan Beals up here. Let's see if I can spot him. Mm. Oh, well, we'll Fighting. see. There's Nathan. Yeah, it's fine right now. Um, <coughs> and he settled um, March 18th, 1834. He, he's up above, oh, he's off the screen there. That's why I can't find him. Um, a Parker family moved southwest of Simon Moon about one month before the town of Westville was founded. Nathan may have traveled uh, with them, but there is no record he owned land. I hear he was a blacksmith. Uh, one article claimed uh, he owned land northeast of Westfield, but the name on the land is Nathan Beals. Uh, Nathan Parker, instead of Simon Moon, is given credit for founding Westfield in the Tomlinson Historical Resume and in the R. Westfield book. Okay, this is the Stanley Carpenter House. Um, it's at 209 West Main Street. <coughs> it's built on land originally owned by Simon Moon. Uh, heavy hand-hewn sill plates are evident around the entire parameter of the house, as well as the transfer beams. Uh, that uh, tie into the seal plates. Simon Moon and his sons would have cut these beams. Roy Hadley and Richard Williams remember being told that the original structure was part of the Underground Railroad. After the Civil War, the log house was taken down by Jeff Neal and put up on the north side of Westville where it now stands. This carpenter style house was built in uh, the late 1800s. The original log, log home could be anywhere north of the anti-slavery Friends Cemetery. The north end of town was just south of the cemetery. 
okay? And this is the uh, plat for Westfield, and notice that West and Field are two separate words. Uh, the town of Westfield in Hamilton County is laid out in the above plan before me, the undersigned and acting justice of the peace within and for said county, personally come Ambrose Osborne, Simon Moon, and Asa Bales and acknowledge the written to be the correct plat and reference to the town of Westfield by them, laid out in, the, in said county of Hamilton in testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and seal the sixth day of May in the year of our Lord, 1,834, Benjamin Wheeler, Justice of the Peace. Notice Main Cross Street right here. Um, north and south through Westville instead of Union Street. The naming of Westville is accredited to Asa Bales. Simon Moon, Asa Bales, and Nathan Parker came originally from or near <laughs> Westfield Monthly Meeting near New Garden, North Carolina. This is um, a North Carolina map. And we have, there's uh, Greensboro. Right above that would be New Garden. Um, Westfield is up here, I've underlined it, and uh, other towns I noticed on there was Friendship, right here next to Greensboro also, which was the name of the ship that the uh, Cox family uh, came to Virginia in, and then down here is Welcome, boy, and there's Welcome, uh, southeast of High Point, Welcome was the name of the ship that the Moon family uh, came to Pennsylvania in, and then down down here is Mooresville, North Carolina, uh, just above Charlotte, up there. So these names keep getting used over and over. Um, from the Tomlinson historical resume, little is known of the work of Ambrose and William Osborne, but Asa Bales and Simon Moon remain to weave their lives and labors indelibly into the history of the growing community. Um, has Steve Osborne given his family history? You haven't given one? Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my mother had a second cousin. It was John Osborne right there. So the families have, have intermarried. Um, and she was close friends with him. At the Zionsville Museum, there's a wall uh, sign honoring uh, Ambrose Ogbine, spelled the same as it is on the uh, plat map. Um, I have a 121-page um, notebook, it's a light green one, over there on the table. Uh, that is the um, Osborne genealogy going back to 1661 in England. The Osborne genealogy includes uh, Ramona Whitaker and Phyllis and Stuart Davis, uh, Milken family, uh, Ludovic Hill and his wife Hazel Tomlinson Hill, who were my uh, Sunday school teachers at the Westville Friends. Um, Lodovic was born in 1890, married at age 21, and was married uh, 63 years. They still held hands and sat close together in church like newlyweds. Mm -hmm. In the uh, 1970s, he bought a new car with cash he had saved up because they did not believe in going into debt for anything. And this is the uh, 1934 centennial with members of the Westfield Friends Church dressed up in the uh, 1834 costumes. And they sat on benches with the women divided from the men as it was done in the Quaker meetings. So you can see the, the women are on this side and then the men are on the other side with the divider. The first Quaker meeting in the area met at the home of Ambrose Osborne in 1833 until the first log meeting house was built in 1835. On, uh, the lot south of the Martha Dome Memorial Park. <clears throat> meeting house consisted of 10, the meeting consisted of 10 to 12 families when a log building 24 by 48 feet was erected and used until 1848. Simon Moon was a charter member of the Westville Friends meeting. Uh, Simon Moon donated land in 1835. Simon Moon donated uh, the land south of the Martha Dome Memorial Park where the Westfield Friends Meeting and the Union Bible Seminary now stand. Um, the Union Academy and High School was founded in 1861. A Union Street was named after the Union Academy. My uncles Wyman and Lester uh, graduated from Union High School. 
Union Bible College uh, Library has a very old book, the uh, collections of the works of William Penn. I know it's hard to read that, but I took, the, I took it from the other angle. Okay, Clarkson Moon wrote, Simon Moon also donate, donated two acres of land where the Dr. Coffin House stood uh, to the Friends Meeting for a hitching ground. This was across the street from the church. Westville was settled largely by members of the Friends Church. In fact, for many years, the place was known as a Quaker town. Um, this is the Martha Dill Memorial Garden. Uh, in 1835, Simon Moon set apart another two acres of land, which he donated to the Society of Friends for a cemetery, known today as Martha Dome Memorial Park. Uh, he was also the first person to be buried there, as he died later that year, August 11, 1835, at the age of 51. Hannah Stout Moon died August 30, 1844, and was buried by his side. Uh, Martha Dome, uh, 1872 to uh, 1960, was one of the outstanding leaders in the Westfield Friends Meeting and was a lifelong member. She went to Cornell College in New York, where she was one of the first women to receive a PhD in chemistry in 1896. She was a professor of chemistry at Vassar College in New York. Martha Dome was a dean of women and professor of chemistry at Earlham College for 11 years. The Dome family bought the land owned by Simon Moon south of State Road 32 and west of South Union Street, which became known as the Dome Farm. Their house was built uh, where the present Marathon Station is at the southeast corner of US 31 and State Road 32. I remember going to a meeting at the United, of the United Society of Friends Women at her house. The house was moved in 1972 to Connor Prairie and is now called the Golden Eagle Inn. Okay, this is uh, Simon Moon, Generation 60, um, born 1784 to uh, 1835, Chatham County, North Carolina, married Hanny, Hannah Stout, um, and that was her bread bowl, and had 10 children. Um, Generation 61 is Riley B. Moon and Susanna Hyatt, had 10 children, born in Hamilton County. <coughs> Riley died September 18th, 1894, at Westfield. And his son is uh, Generation 62, Elwood Moon, uh, and we'll discuss him later. Okay, Generation 63 is Allison Moon, born in 1873 at Westfield. He married Ida Mae Johnson and had five children, Wyman, Lester, Wilna, Elsie, and Alice. Okay, and Generation 64 is my mother, Elsie Moon. She married Daryl Jesse Cox. Um, here we go. Uh, oops, I went too far. So I to get back. Here we go. This is the Riley Moon Homestead. Um, it's Elwood and Rachel Moon is in the picture. Simon's son Riley, uh, Born in North Carolina, was still a child when he came to Indiana with his father and mother in 1820. He grew up in an anti-slavery atmosphere. They were active members of the Society of Friends. Clarkson Moon wrote, Riley Moon and Susanna Hyatt were married April 28, 1837, and moved to their farm two miles north of Westfield. Okay. Um, William and Simon Moon Jr. were also active in the Underground Railroad, but Riley is the best known ancestor of the present day residents. Riley and his wife lived on Flippin Road for 52 years. Riley Moon was actively connected with the Underground Railroad and made his home station where slaves were hidden in the daytime. Um, I've got the uh, cowbell from Riley Moon Farm there on the table. Uh, Riley Moon worked as a farmer in Washington Township. He died September 19, 1894. Susanna died in 1890. They were buried at Summit Lawn Cemetery south of Westfield. On the Moon Bread Bowl is a picture of the house where Riley Moon lived. Uh, this picture was taken uh, when the bowl was <coughs> on display at the uh, new Westfield High School. 
<coughs> okay. Uh, in the letter on the back of the bread bowl, my Aunt Alice writes, Riley Moon was a strong leader in helping slaves to escape from the by the Underground Railroad. Hay was put in wagons and the slaves would crawl underneath and the hay would keep them from being caught. Okay, this is the George Douglas house uh, before the fire that happened in 2004. Notice the walnut paneling. Uh, this would have been Riley Moon's home. Two miles north of Westfield on Flippin' Road, the property of George Douglas family holds the original farm home built by Riley Moon. The work of the Anti-Slavery League was so secret that real names were not used. Correspondence was in code and roots were named after species of trees native to the area. The central root, root south to north through the center of Indiana could well have been walnut since that tree was plentiful in those times. This is the uh, barn, the Rally Moon barn, uh, where slaves were hidden. The field stone floor was cemented over in 2000, but the picture was taken before, and you can see these are huge rocks that have been flattened to, to make the floor. And that's the exterior of the uh, Douglas home. But you can tell that it's the same building if you look at it really close that it was in the other picture. Okay, the upper story of the house was a single room. Elsie Moon, Riley's granddaughter, lived in the house in the early 1900s between her fourth and seventh birthdays and was the youngest of four children at the time. At the top of an enclosed stairway, a small inconspicuous door near the floor opened to a tiny room below the stairs. She said the Moon children opened the little door and peeked in, but they never had the nerve to enter. The door was just big enough for a skinny person. It's at the top of the stairs there. So like a linen closet, except that the bottom comes up. The mystery and adventure of the reported activities of the forebears had an effect on the Moon children. Mrs. Elsie Moon Cox tells of a mischievous prank she and her sister Wilna played on their brothers, Wyman and Lester. The boys slept in the upstairs room, their beds near the top of the stairs. One day, Mrs. Cox said, her sister asked if she wanted to scare the boys. I'll hide under the bed, Wilma said. When I give the signal, you jump up at the foot of the bed and I'll jump up at the head. The boys were scared, but not so much by their sisters, but by the little door which sprang open when the girls jumped on the floor. Lester fainted, Mrs. Cox said. As she remembers it, it took nearly an hour to revive him. <laughs> the implications of the trap door were serious business to the great uh, grandfather's time. Um, tales of the network of runaway slaves were a part of the Moon family oral history, Mrs. Cox said. I remember Mother reading to us from Uncle Tom's cabin night after night, and when she came to the part uh, about the dismal, I would shiver. It seemed so real. When she was a child, there was a forbidding, low-lying, marshy area no known as the Dismal Swamp north of the Moon Farm. It, too, played a role in providing cover for fugitives as they moved further north to the next station. In our Westfield, page 16, the story of slaves named John and it says Ruan in the book, but it should be Luann uh, Rhodes and their family. A Riley Moon is described as providing transportation from Robert Tomlinson's across the dismal swamp to the Lindley home. Now drained, the area is marked by a well-defined dip in US 31 between 196th Street and Indiana 38. Um, this picture was taken uh, in July of 2008. Um, Hand wood in the barn, uh, some walnut, walnut paneling was replaced after the fire in 2004. This is all new paneling, it's not the original. But the barn still shows the hand you uh, lumber. Uh, the, um, after the fire, the linen closet on the stairs was removed. It's no longer there. Heavy hand hewn uh, walnut sill plates and trans trans transverse beams were revealed when the house was restored after smoke damage. I have more pictures uh, on the back of the uh, slide book over there on the table of the uh, restoration of the interior part of the Douglas house that was the Moon Homestead. 
And these are the children of royal men. Um, that daughter, Hannah. Now remember, Anna Mar Maria Moon was born in Hamilton County in Indiana and married Richard M. Beals in 1862 at Hinkley, uh, Hinkle Creek Friends Meeting. Uh, they will come up a number of times in the history. Um, Almeda Jane Moon married Thomas Inman, Amanda Jane, and Emily Catherine. Okay. Uh, Elwood Moon was born in uh, 1845 uh, to 1930 in Hamilton County. He married uh, Rachel Carson March 30th, 1869 at Westfield. They had 12 children at Westfield where he was a farmer at the Riley Moon Homestead. Uh, Clarkson H. Moon, uh, born in Westfield, uh, he married uh, Charity Carson in 1871 and married uh, Mary E. Moore in 1876. This Clarkson Moon contributed one of the William Moon uh, histories. Uh, Edith Ann, uh, Eva, uh, Medora, and Rachel. Uh, Riley Moon's descendants have a uh, Moon reunion the first Sunday in August. I'm the chairperson for that Moon reunion. Okay, Quaker again. Uh, Quakers continue to be characterized by strong individualism. Monthly and quarterly meetings channel business upward from the local meetings to the yearly meeting. London yearly meeting between uh, 1699 and 1798 coordinated business at a national and regional level. <coughs> uh, Richmond, Indiana, the yearly meeting in 1844. Indiana yearly meeting of friends uh, uh, included meetings in the west half of Ohio and the east half of Indiana. Plainfield became the location of Western Yearly Meeting, which includes the west half of Indiana and the east half of Illinois. Uh, Westfield is, Westfield is in Western uh, Yearly Meeting. Uh, Richmond is also the location of what was called the Five Years Meeting. It's now meeting every three years, uh, which unites the two yearly meetings and it's now called Friends United Meeting. Uh, it's the Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840. By 1840, all Quakers had freed their slaves voluntarily. Uh, the pioneers in the Underground Railroad movement were almost ostracized from the society of their neighbors, hmm. and some of them were disowned for their, uh, from their meetings. Uh, Riley and Susanna Moon were disowned for disunity April 11, 1844 because of their Underground Railroad activity. Okay, two months after Simon Moon <coughs> came to what was a densely wooded wilderness on December 4, 1832, Asa Bells followed from Mooresville. It was not a coincidence that subsequently many houses and barns in and around Westville were built with hiding places. The Underground Railroad stations where barns, homes, and outbuildings about 10 to 15 miles apart, where runaway slaves were concealed, fed, and set on well-worn trails to the uh, northern states in Canada. Slaves were taken at night from hideout to hideout, being hauled on uh, over back roads in wagons, carriages, and on horseback. Asa Bales owned much property in the Westfield area. One house is still standing and is located at 321 North Union Street. Asa and Susanna Bales had no children of their own. And this is a Bales genealogy, but it also uh, includes quite a few other people. Uh, starting out here with Gaius Julius Caesar and down to Julius Caesar, and that goes down to the King of the Franks and the King of France. So they, they are French in background, and you might recognize some names on there. Okay, now. Um, we get down to Generation 63 here, William Clayton. A lot of people from Westfield are related to William and uh, Prudence uh, Clayton. Uh, William Clayton, born in 1632, uh, Generation uh, 68, down here at the bottom, there's Asa Bales. Um, and Susanna Russell, married in Westfield, monthly meeting North Carolina. The descendants of William Clayton include Asa Bales, Levi Coffin, Harmon Cox, and my grandmother's Ida Mae Johnson and Ida Mae Bond Cox. And this is a great grandfather Johnson there and my grandfather Cox. Of course, right there is uh, Allie Moon and uh, 
Ida Mae Johnson, and this is my grandfather, who see, changed a little bit, a little bit over the years, and my brother. <laughs> Okay, this is the Ace of Bales sales book on February 4th through 6th in 1840. At the bottom right, you have Ace of Bales. He bought tallow for 313. Let's find him down here. Oh, right there. And then Aaron Lindley bought some soap for $1.40. Aaron Lindley right there. And then William Moon uh, bought calico for $4.85. Notice all three were involved in the Underground Railroad and they're at the store at the, about the same time. I wonder if they were having a meeting. <laughs> okay, this is a map of uh, Westfield. It's from the Hamilton County Stories and Leg Legends by Isabella Fearhiley. Um, this shows the first addition to the town of Westfield by Asa Bales, 18 lots. Um, on August 22nd, 1837, on the west side of Union Street, lots 49 through 66, right up here. And then the second edition, uh, lots 67 to uh, 76, uh, was on October 22nd, 1837. Also shown are the locations. Oh, here's the second edition right there. Okay, uh, uh, locations of Isabel's house up here. Um, on the west side of Union Street, above Penn Street. Uh, tannery on West Main, right down here. That was uh, Simon Moon's land, and he was a tanner. Um, William Osborne's house, uh, just assuming that, it's on his property. <laughs> and the first public school on Lot 74 up here. Uh, the Friends Church down here. And the uh, cemetery south on South Union Street. Uh, best known as the president of the Underground Railroad, uh, was born in uh, Levi Coffin was born in 1789 in Guilford County, North Carolina, and attended the Friends Meeting at New Garden, North Carolina, six miles from Greensboro. He and his wife Catherine, or Kate, moved to Indiana on September 26, uh, August, September 1826. Uh, Underground Railroad were often classed at as thieves and robbers, a few courageous men and women quietly continued the work and endured the slights and insults of former friends and neighbors until the community experienced a revolution of sentiments. A minority of about 2,000 out of 20,000 friends joined in the dissident group, but it did contain vocal and influential members. Uh, when ab abolition became popular in this section of the country, activist Levi Coffin of Newport, Indiana, stirred up the Society of Friends which resulted in the establishment of the Indiana Yearly Meeting of Anti-Slavery Friends in 1843. The book From Slavery to Freedom by Wilbur Siebert says, in aiding fugitive slaves, the abolitionists were making the most effective protest against the continuance of slavery. But uh, he was also doing something more tangible. He was helping the oppressed. He was taking risks, defying the law and making himself liable to punishment, and yet who glow with the healthy pleasure of duty done. From the primitive history of Hamilton County, it says many of those engaged in the work of the Underground Railroad were people of irreproachable moral and Christian character, and although they were acting in direct violation of the laws of the country, they were motivated by sincere conviction that they were obeying God's command to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked. They faced dangers boldly, although at all times they exercised the greatest precaution, both for their own and for the sakes of the fugitives. Sometimes surprising audacity was demonstrated. Uh, in Westville, active assistance to escaping slaves was bound to bring violent confrontation with pursuing slave owners. Uh, and after 1850, when the fugitive slave law was enacted uh, with local authorities and U.S. Marshals, in the beginning, uh, the anti-slavery movement was very unpopular, both within and without the French church. The members of which opposed, composed a large portion, portion of the community in and about Westfield. Um, the West, at Westfield, Aaron Lindley helped establish a monthly meeting of anti-slavery friends, March 4, 1843. 
Most other anti-slavery friends were in the eastern part of the state where abolitionist feeling seemed to run higher. Asa Bales gave land at 335 North Union Street to the anti-slavery friends meeting for a meeting house and a burial ground. Here's the Bales sales book again, uh, February 10th, 1840. And we have Harmon Cox, let's see, he's the uh, fourth one up here. There he is, Harmon Cox, the first settler in the uh, township. And then down below is Aaron Lindley, down here at the bottom. Uh, let's see, uh, Har Harmon Cox bought coffee for 25 cents. Couldn't read what Aaron had bought. A large meeting house was erected in the use when Asa Bales died at the age of 50 on September 10, 1845, and his wife also died October 27, 1845, of cholera, also have, not having made a deed. The records of the Westville anti-slavery friends were found by Henry Eckert. Active members were Antrim, Bales, Bates, Bond, Cook, Davis, Doan, Hadley, Hammer, Hyatt, Hollingsworth, Jones, Lamb, Lindley, Moon, Moore, Pickett, Pierce, Pike, Presnell, Roberts, Stout, Sumner, Talbert, Tomlinson, Warren, White, Willits, and Wright. All names except for Hammer and Warren are found in the Moon genealogy. The Friends' queries showed concern about not pursuing purchasing goods produced by slave labor. The anti-slavery Friends meeting discontinued in 1854. Floyd and Moselle Carson's home was built on the land in 1928. The burial ground to the west of the house continued to be used by the families of the, that had been anti-slavery Friends during the 19th century and is a resting place of 11 Civil War veterans. I have brought the uh, faith and practice of Western Yearly Meeting a French church dated uh, 1974 and another one 1986. The queries are uh, chapter four of part two. As the name implies, the contents of the faith and practice can vary with the different yearly meetings. Not all Quakers believe the same thing. Members of both the original and the anti-slavery Friends meetings were active in the Underground Railroad. The Society of Friends eventually opened the doors to take back all those who had been disowned on account of their anti-slavery work, and many who had been most opposed to the Underground Railroad became involved. In the 1800s, there were 21 Friends meetings in Washington Township. Okay, I'm just gonna point out a few here. Uh, some of the marriages were at Rich Land, that's down here just north of Carmel, and uh, that one was found in 1833 and discontinued in 1894. <coughs> Uh, the Westfield Conservative Meeting uh, was founded in 1879, and that was on uh, West Main, or East Main Street here. Um, that house was um, caught fire, and they, they used it for an uh, exercise for the fire department. The, uh, the Westville Anti-Slavery was founded in uh, 1843. Of course, we know that one's up north of town here. And then the uh, the Westfield uh, regular meeting on South Union Street, found in 1835. And then Hinkle, Hinkle Creek that was mentioned earlier is clear up here. Actually, it's on, uh, if you go up Moontown Road, you get to uh, Hinkle Creek. It's kind of off the map. Okay, I'm not going to go through this a whole lot except that this is just the, uh, the yearly meetings in, in uh, America. And you can see the, the Quakers split repeatedly, many times, many ways. At the top is the conservative, and then you've got the evangelistic, and then you've got the friends like is here on South Union Street. Um, the only friends quarterly meeting that had more monthly meetings uh, than uh, the Westfield monthly meeting was London, England. The meetings uh, were close together because of the difficult to travel. So this area was really thick with Quakers, if it compared to uh, London, England. 
I have brought a, um, my 1889 family Bible and a, a notebook with pictures of the engravings, uh, lithographs, uh, since the uh, Bible is too old and fragile to be turning the pages. But you can look at all the uh, lithographs that, are, that I've scanned, and they're in the notebook. Often the fugitives reach the north almost destitute of clothing and sick from uh, wanton exposure. Women were also active in the Underground Railroad, although they did not personally conduct uh, fugitives through the forest and swamps. They opened uh, their doors of their homes, provided food, spun and wove cloth for clothing, and nursed the sick back to health. Often homes had false walls, cellars, and, or attics, which afforded hiding places. They exercised the greatest precaution, both for their own and for the sakes of the helpless fugitives. Everything was done with the most secret manner and with the whereabouts of the fugitives being known to as few as possible. Uh, slaves were concealed for days about the premises of a home unknown to the neighbors and visitors or even to a portion of the family. Often families of slaves were transported together, being taken in large covered wagons drawn by horses. Sometimes those wagons had false bottoms and trap doors, which offered hiding places for quick escape. Drivers could start out late at night and be well on their way by dawn. In the first years of the operation, the routes could not go directly north to Tipton County. Um, it was still undeveloped. Um, and the passage was uh, to the Thorntown area. Westville did have black residents at an early date and uh, was not far south of the Roberts settlement uh, where the uh, colony of blacks could uh, be of assistance. Westville uh, became, became regarded in a different light from the standpoint of the slave who was being helped to freedom and the slaveholder who regarded it as an abolitionist hotbed where, the, where he could receive no justice. It was said by slave hunters that when a slave got to Westfield, it wasn't worthwhile to look any further for him. Uh, from the Tomlinson historical resume, Westfield had a wide reputation for being an anti-slavery town. In the yearbook of the Society of Indiana Pioneers, Westfield is listed as an important station in the Underground Railroad. The head manager of this work was Asa Bales. Three of Simon Moon's sons were active in the Underground Railroad. One of them was Riley Moon. His homestead at Flippin Road is one of the few remaining Underground Railroad sites. Uh, the people themselves were pioneers in the true sense of the word. They blazed their way into the unbroken forest filled with hope and ideals of a young republic in which they were a part. Alert, intelligent, and willing to contribute their minds, bodies, and souls to live uh, lives of hard labor, labor, anxiety, suffering, and privation for the cause of building up their community, their uh, country, and their fellow man. Uh, this picture was taken in 1923 on, but, well, that's the wrong picture. Okay. Well, yeah, that is the, uh, the Westville French Church before all the renovations and changes. This is a, just a Sunday school class. And that, then this is a more current picture down here. Okay, this is a moon reunion. Elwood and Rachel are sitting here in the middle. And my grandmother, Ida May, and my grandfather, Allison, with uh, Wyman and Lester. Uh, this is another um, moon family. Rachel and Elwood right here. There's Allison up there, my, my grandfather. Okay, and this again is um, Rachel, Carson Moon with, with her sons. And then this one is, this is, picture I believe is in the, uh, our Westfield book. Uh, Allie Moon, Ida Mae Johnson Moon, uh, B. Wyman and Lester, and Wilna, my mother, Elsie, and Alice, the youngest. Okay, the children of Alice and Moon, Wyman Moon, 18, uh, 
1998 to 1963, born at Castleton. Uh, Wyman researched the William Moon history, and he's in the covered moon picture. His wife, Lula, was an artist and painted the picture on the uh, moon bread bowl. They lived <coughs> at Noblesville. Uh, Lester Moon was from 1900 to 1939. Wilma Moon, 1902 to 1986. Uh, Elsie Leotta Moon, born November 17, 1904, at Indianapolis. She married Daryl Jesse Cox at Noblesville and had two children born in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Alice Moon, uh, 1908 to 2002, she graduated from Cleveland Bible College with a degree in theology and worked at a foundling home in Cleveland, Ohio. She married Reverend Earl Rothgib in 1942. Alice gave me the family bread bowl with the letter about Riley Moon. This is another Moon reunion, 1909. Uh, and we have Elwood and Rachel again. And there's my, there's my mother. I can, I can usually pick her out. <laughs> <laughs> another, this was with the grandchildren. Elwood and, and Rachel. Um, that's Wilna, that's my mother, and Alice would be right over there. Now you can see the moon reunions are getting bigger. This is 1957, <laughs> 1958, 1959. That's a pretty good size one. Now here's my mother and me and my daughter Teresa and my husband at the time, Delbert Beach. Okay, this is the gravestones for uh, Wilna, or Allie and Ida Mae Moon. Um, uh, Wilna became a grade school teacher at a two-room schoolhouse at Jollyettville, and later uh, at Westfield and Kokomo for 24 years. She was a minister at Bethel Friends Meeting at Kokomo for a total of 33 years. The gravestones, um, Ali Moon, son of Elwood Moon, and wife Ida Mae Johnson, da the daughter Wilna Moon, right over here, that's her gravestone. And uh, this Lester Moon is Lester Moon Jr., which is the, uh, the son of, of Lester Moon that died at 39. Uh, Lester Moon Jr. was raised by Wilna Moon when both of his parents died. He became a high school principal. <coughs> Okay, this is my mother, Elsie Cox. She's a great uh, granddaughter of uh, Simon Moon. She graduated from Danville High School and Central Normal College. She taught business education and Latin for a total of 35 years in Hamilton County, including seven years at Sheridan and 26 years at Westfield. She was a celebrated teacher and also sponsored many school clubs. Uh, Elsie Moon married Daryl Jesse Cox in 1942. She was uh, very active in the community. Uh, 1964 to 65 Shamrock yearbook was dedicated to Mrs. Elsie Liotta Cox and spoke of her dedication to the art of teaching. In 1964, Alana Harvey wrote an article for the ledger. Mrs. Elsie Cox is Westville High School's ide ideal teacher, she wrote. To me and to many, she has given a helping hand without realizing what she had done she has helped many of depressed and discouraged person over her 31 years of teaching. Um, Elsie and Daryl Cox helped fund a community uh, church in Dayton, Ohio, when they lived there from 1942 to 1947. And this picture was taken in 1964. There's a Sunday school class at the Westfield Friends Church, and there I am. My, my brother's right over there, Carmen. Um, Elsie Cox was a bookkeeper for Quaker Haven Church Camp for seven summers between 1951 and 1959. Quaker Haven at Durrett Lake provided camping facilities for Indiana and Western Yearly Meeting. Um, Elsie Moon, Citizen of the Century, uh, 1984, Westfield Sesquicentennial. Two community leaders were chosen Citizen of the Century. 
the selection committee looked for individuals who represented the kind of people who lived in Westfield, strong, friendly, willing to serve, and help those in need. They also wanted to honor Westfield's first settler who gave strong leadership and roots in the area. And the plaque that she is holding there in her hand, I, it's over there on the table somewhere. This was the uh, sesquicentennial parade. I'm right there in the back row on the other side. Uh, this is the Moon Reunion 1990 at Forest Park. Okay, 1996, Elsie um, L. Moon was the Grand Marshal for the Westville Summerfest Parade. She was a past president of the Women's Afternoon Club and active in NOWADA Extension Homemakers Club. She was Hamilton County's first senior citizen queen from Westfield. In 1963, Elsie Cox was president of the Business and Professional Women's Club when they sold the Westville, Indiana Crossroads of the Nation plate as a fundraiser. And I have one of the plates over there on the table. She was a birthright member of the Friends Church. She was a member of the United Society of Friends Women and a Sunday school teacher. Mrs. Cox said, we have always been active in church and education in Westfield. Um, Elsie L. Cox died February 27, 1998, at the age of 93, and was buried next to her husband, Daryl Jesse Cox, uh, 1897 to 1947, who was a private in the 71st Engineers in World War I. There's some more pictures of my father. There's the um, Moon uh, coat of arms, or not Moon, the Cox coat of arms. And there he is in his uh, World War I uniform. In 1998, Westfield Washington High School uh, wall next to the gym, there are two uh, bricks that are dedicated to Elsie L. Moon Cox for her teaching. Uh, from 1930 to 1971. Okay, in 2007, a book was dedicated to Mrs. Cox um, by Martha Pettigo. It says, Mrs. Cox was Martha Pettigo's high school teacher. She lived with her the last two years of high school and helped to take care of Carmen and Carol. She described Mrs. Cox as unassuming, quiet, and inspiring, uh, inspiring Martha to go to college and to get a degree uh, at a Quaker Cleveland College, Bible College in theology. She said, without her quiet leading, I wonder whether I would have enrolled in college at all. Martha wrote about her missionary experiences in Africa, South America, South Dakota, and travels in Europe and Israel. Okay, this is the 2007 Moon Reunion. And here we have Josephine Shelley Beals, uh, 1909 to 2007. Uh, at the age of uh, 98. She married uh, July 4th, uh, 1929, to Richard Elwood Beals, son of Riley M. Beals, son of Richard Beals, and Anna Moon, daughter of Riley Moon and Simon Moon. Okay. Next is um, Steve Riley Cox, uh, son of Carl Cox and Grace Beals. Daughter of Riley M. Moon, son of Richard Beals, and Anna Moon, daughter of Riley Moon, uh, son of Simon Moon. And then on the end here we have Clarence and Sarah Wood. Clarence is the great, great, great grandson of Simon Moon through Riley and his son Elwood. And they've been married 71 years. And now, finishing up, there's the Simon Moon Park on the South Street, east, uh, east of the utility building. And there's the uh, Underground Railroad that uh, my husband drew for the emblem for the uh, Historical Society. Oops. And that's some of my talks. And uh, I'm the inspector for the Oak Bridge Precinct 1, member of the Eagle Creek Evangelical Friends Church. Um, and we've had our moon reunions there for the last, well, since 2002. Uh, John Dobbins Speck, I help him with uh, a Bible class that he teaches at Maple Park uh, Senior Living Center at Westfield. And we have incorporated our own church, Grace Bible Mission, to 501c3. Uh, and there's a church that I helped found um, back 1970. 
<laughs> I got a typo. <laughs> I got so used to putting that eight on there. Okay, and the last one, my wedding picture. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. If you have any questions or want to look at the things, you're welcome to do so. Well, thank you, Carol. That was very interesting. Uh, there is refreshments in the back. Uh, help yourselves, everybody. And, uh, of course, look at all the uh, items that she's brought in. I think the bread bowl is one of the interesting things yeah. I always like. I have a couple questions. Okay. okay. My exact question. Uh, first of all, um, if we do this program again in a couple of years, is it going to be the two-parter or... It seems to be getting longer. No, it seems to be getting I, longer. I, t I timed it out in an hour and 20 minutes. That's and I great. Could, I didn't know what to cut it's out. so much information. I could have yeah. cut out the last couple of generations, I suppose, but... No, it's, it's great. It's great information. A uh, couple of little questions. Um, if you don't know it now, I'll send you an email and ask you later. You had the information in there about Asa Bales, that yeah. he was disowned uh, from the Morrisville yeah. meeting. Mm -hmm. Do you know where it came from? Can you? Let me I might know? be able to track it down. I, it might be in some of the um, right. the things in the uh, green notebook. That over would there. be that would be great to know for yeah. for more than one reason. And then um, I wasn't aware of that. Maybe other people know already. The the anti-slavery records you said were yeah. found by Henry Eckert. Eckert. Yeah. Where are they? I don't know where they are now. Oh. oh. Um, Did he donate them? A lot them, of my or? information, you know, I've gotten from newspaper clippings and. Right. Uh, at one time, he wanted to sell those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Years ago. Years ago. Somebody's got them still. Yeah, it would be good to have. I think it was just the one women's side. Yeah, it was It was the women's meeting, but those were the names. Those were the families mm -hmm. that were active. Oh, it was the women's meeting? Okay. Yeah. I think, I think they have them in Richmond. But, I mean, too, I the know. women wouldn't be there if the men weren't there, too. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> definitely. definitely. The Bales uh, store... Ledger. Where is it at? Um, you guys found that, didn't you? We took pictures of it uh, a couple few years ago. Really? I just gave it to the library. Did you? Yeah, okay. The library you. has it now? The library has it. Maybe. I don't there know. There was a, a number of books. There was more than one book. The Society has the book. We do? Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. I thought that. so. I thought you <laughs> It was given by the clerk treasurer about. No, those are different books. No. The town? Somebody, gave, somebody so? gave the library some old ledgers. Yeah, I thought some of them did go to the library. But we should ask oh, the what library. What they found at the library? In the last 14 years, none, nothing has left this, well, this town was, that's gone to the library. It may have gone earlier than that because this was found in the basement. We should talk to the library because they like to. I'd like to see that. Uh, that was interesting. I, you had some of those. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of pictures that I took. These are just two, but I've got a whole bunch of pictures. We need to find out where that's at. <laughs> We've got it. We need to get it out. Yeah. Hmm. I know we, we have some we of the other ones. Yeah, we had it at one, one of our meetings, but I didn't know for sure where it went from there. Stones are there, but the soldiers are not buried there. Pittman's stone is actually there. Took pictures of it. 
Yeah. But he is buried west of Big Springs in a family home. So I don't know. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. So I <laughs> I was wondering if it was still in there or not. That's a heavy wheel. <laughs> Probably, probably LC's, probably the LC school bell. You don't know we have the Washington Township part of that in our museum on a computer too. Yeah. What year is this? Um, that's the, the that's the original one, yeah, the original. Yeah, we don't have that one. We have the 1866. But we want to include that one next. As soon as we find some volunteers, IUPUI especially would be good. There was more than just some. They acquired Samuel Bryant and his folks. Yeah. So glad I brought my camera because almost a two hours now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but.